Hey guys, I'm Bob Mata, criminal defense attorney and host of Defense Diaries. This season, we're jumping into the twisted mind of serial killer John Wayne Gacy. So if you want to hear what actually happened, check out Defense Diaries on the iHeartRadio app or wherever you get your pods. Hi there, I'm Christy. And I'm Heather. We're two best friends, longtime comedians, and hosts of the podcast Sinisterhood, the true crime comedy podcast that covers all things creepy. With thorough research and legal insights from me, a real-life lawyer, we'll bring you the in-depth details on all the cases you crave on topics like serial killers, disappearances, cults, cryptids, and even Britney Spears' conservatorship. Listen to Sinisterhood on the iHeart app or wherever you get your podcasts. Hello, listeners. I'm your host, Amara, and this is Black Girl Gone, a true crime podcast. On this episode of Black Girl Gone, we share the story of Akia Eggleston, a 22-year-old woman from Baltimore, Maryland, who disappeared in May 2017 after failing to show up for her own baby shower. Akia was eight months pregnant and the mother of a two-year-old. After four years, Akia is still missing, and there are very few answers about her disappearance. This is a key story. In 2017, Akia Eggleston was eight months pregnant when she disappeared from Baltimore, Maryland. At 22 years old, Akia had already experienced one of the biggest losses you could experience when you are a young woman. Akia's mom died of breast cancer, and Akia took the loss of her mom hard. As expected, Losing your mom at a young age often changes people. And Akia was no different. According to those closest to her, the death of her mom had changed Akia. Oxygen premiered a show in 2019 called Searching for Akia Eggleston. And during that show, Akia's aunt said that Akia had gone through a rebellious time after losing her mom. She described it as acting out. But we all grieve in different ways, and Akia handled her grief the way that she knew how. Akia, however, had a really great support system around her. People who really loved Akia and tried to help her through the harder moments. And her stepdad, Sean Wilkinson, was one of them. You know, sidebar, shout out to all the step-parents out there because they really don't get enough credit. But... Life for Akia began to move on after her mom's death, and Akia eventually became a mom herself. She gave birth to a little girl, and her family said that Akia was a great mom. I'm sure that not having her mom probably drew her closer to her daughter. Now, there isn't much publicly known about Akia's relationship with her daughter's father, But by the fall of 2016, Akia had moved on to a new relationship and was pregnant with her second child. But this relationship was one Akia kept from her family. And they allege that they ultimately did not find out who he was until after Akia disappeared. In April 2017, Akia was preparing to welcome her second child. She had decided that she was going to have a baby shower and a gender reveal for the baby boy that she was carrying. Akia had chosen to have the shower at a location in downtown Baltimore, and so Akia sent out invitations, and she put a $900 deposit down on the shower. And even though Akia wasn't disclosing the name of the baby's father, Her family was happy for her and supportive throughout her pregnancy. The pregnancy itself, however, had been a tough one for Akia. The baby she was carrying was breech, and so as a result, her doctor had placed her on bed rest. According to her stepdad, Akia was having trouble walking, and she had stopped working during this pregnancy. But despite the difficulties from the pregnancy, 
Akia was excited about the baby and was looking forward to her shower and gender reveal party. Akia's shower was scheduled for May 7th, 2017. And on the day of her shower, Akia's friends and family arrived at the venue. But Akia did not show up. Akia's friends and family waited for her to arrive. But when calls to her phone went unanswered, they went over to Akia's apartment to check on her. But when they arrived, Akia was not at the apartment. But even more strange, personal items like clothing and the crib for the new baby were also gone from the apartment. So Akia's friends and family start to try to figure out who was the last person to speak to Akia. And when they realize that no one has actually spoken to Akia since May the 3rd, they all know something is wrong. Akia's grandmother said that on May 3rd, she had been calling Akia and that Akia was not answering her phone. But she did say that she received a text from Akia and that she told her grandmother that she couldn't talk right now and that she would call her back, which she never did. Now, in the episode of Searching for Akia Eggleston, Akia's grandmother said that she doesn't believe that the person texting her back was Akia. And so once the people close to Akia realize that it's actually been like three or four days since anyone spoke to her, they go to the police to file a missing person report. Now, keeping in mind that Akia was eight months pregnant and currently on bed rest, her family and friends checked local hospitals to make sure that Akia and the baby hadn't experienced some, you know, kind of emergency and she was in the hospital unable to communicate with them. But there was no sign of Akia at any of the local hospitals. Now, police, however, did not immediately start looking for Akia. Despite the strange circumstances of her disappearance, the police are initially less than concerned that no one has heard from this woman who was eight months pregnant. Their rationale is that she's 22 and she probably left on her own. But after several weeks and pleas from Akia's family, Baltimore police began looking into Akia's disappearance. Now, she was eight months pregnant and therefore there are two potential victims. And also, based on what her family has told detectives, they know that Akia was dealing with a high-risk pregnancy, and so leaving on her own was way down on the list of possibilities. Also, all of Akia's social media activity had stopped too, which for a girl who was consistently posting on her social media, that was a very bad sign. And so early in the investigation, the police get what looks like a promising lead about Akia's last movements. Police were able to locate surveillance video from May 3rd, 2017, and it showed Akia at a bank near the Baltimore Harbor. Now, on the day Akia is seen on the surveillance, she has asked a friend for a ride because Akia did not drive. So the friend takes Akia to the bank where Akia withdraws a few hundred dollars. According to her stepfather, it was somewhere between $700 and $900. Now, on the surveillance footage, Akia appears to be acting normal, and she does not appear to be under any duress. The transaction goes normally, and then, according to Akia's friend, she drives Akia back to her apartment. But that would be the last time that anyone admits to seeing Akia again. So, why was Akia withdrawing that amount of money from her account? Well, no one in Akia's family could figure that out, or why she would have been you know, taking that kind of money out, what she would have been using it for. However, while interviewing Akia's friends, 
police find out that Akia was planning to move out of the apartment that she shared with a roommate and her roommate's child. Akia had apparently told several friends that she was planning to move out of the apartment so that she could move in with her unborn son's father. But Akia's family doesn't know anything about Akia moving. She has not mentioned her plans to move to her family. And so for them, hearing about Akia's plans to move out of her apartment was news to them. Akia's closest family, however, actually disputed the idea that Akia was planning to move. Because even though Akia was not revealing to them who the child's father was, they insisted that she would have told them if she was moving. Her grandmother recalled going to Akia's apartment a few days before she last spoke to her and that there were no signs that Akia was planning to move. No boxes, no nothing packed. So for her family, Akia moving just really didn't make any sense. But for police, the theory might actually give them some much needed answers. And for police, that might explain why when family and friends arrived at Akia's apartment on May 3rd, the day Akia was supposed to show up at her baby shower, that some of Akia's belongings were gone from the apartment, allegedly, including some furniture and most of Akia's clothes. You know, the theory that Akia moved or was in the process of moving was supported by her friend's statements and text messages between her and a friend where Akia says that she was planning to be out of the apartment by May 10th which would have been seven days after she went missing and three days before her shower. Her roommate also confirmed that Akia was planning to move out. Now, Akia was 22 at this time, and even though her family claims that Akia would have told them that she was moving, you know, maybe she wouldn't have. And the text messages from her friends indicate that Akia was at least planning to move out. But the problem is that even if Akia was planning to move out, you know, cool, but who helped her move? Because she's eight months pregnant and she's four foot eight. So she didn't move by herself and she definitely didn't move a crib by herself. But no one seemed to know who helped Akia move, including her roommate. And as far as I could piece together, she also didn't seem to know when the missing furniture or clothing had been moved out of the apartment. And also, Akia's stuff, like her, was just gone. You know, if she was moving, wouldn't her stuff be at the location she moved to at, you know, at least or or somewhere? So where was Akia planning to move. Well, police do suspect that the money Akia withdrew that day could have possibly been intended, you know, to be used for her move. Her family, however, soon learns that Akia was tending to move to a place that actually didn't exist. At least that's what her stepfather says during an episode of IDs the Missing. Now, there isn't any detail that I could find about how he found out this information, but he also learns around that same time who Akia's unborn child's father was. The man that had fathered Akia's child was someone that her stepfather already knew. Apparently, he was a friend of his, but her stepfather had no idea that his friend had been having a relationship with his daughter. And I think most people listening can understand why now Akia may not have wanted to tell her family who the father was. And perhaps the baby's father also didn't want anyone to know, especially Akia's stepfather. But, you know, at the end of the day, Akia was not a child. I mean, she was a consenting adult. And so 
if she had made the choice to be in a relationship with another consenting adult, that was really, really between the two of them. So, you know, but however, for whatever reason, Akia does not want her fam to know, whether it's because of her child's father or it's a choice of her own. She does not want them to know. So her family now knows the identity of the father of Akia's unborn child. And they also know that Akia was talking to her friends about moving. But for them, this does not answer any questions because the fact that no one has heard from Akia still doesn't make any sense. Now, there is absolutely no evidence that Akia just walked away. She had a daughter that she adored, and she was not in any condition to just up and leave. She was also looking forward to the birth of her son and the baby shower that she missed. And so once the police and Akia's family learned the identity of her child's father, he was definitely someone the police needed to speak with. And the police did speak to him. But police will not disclose the conversation they had with him and refuse to share any information with Akia's family. During an interview with the True Crime Daily, the investigator on the case wouldn't even say if her child's father was being cooperative. But according to Akia's family... He wasn't helping them in their search for her, which for them was a huge red flag and raised their suspicion that he knew more than he was saying. And even though Akia's stepfather knew this man and had a prior friendship with him, police had instructed him not to contact him. But regardless, he's not arrested, named a suspect, or an official person of interest either. And with police remaining tight-lipped about what he told them, Akia's family is really left with no answers. With all the information police do have, they, after weeks, have finally concluded that foul play may have been involved in Akia's disappearance. As part of their investigation, police had pulled surveillance footage from outside of Akia's apartment and from public transportation buses in Baltimore, but there was nothing. No trace of Akia, no sign that she left on her own either. Now, because the Baltimore police had been less than forthcoming about their investigation, there are so many holes and conflicting information out there about Akia's disappearance and the last day that she was seen. Police indicate that the day Akia is seen in their surveillance at the bank, May 3rd, she was also captured on a camera at several other locations, including Wells Fargo and a Royal Farms gas station, where they say she withdrew money from the ATM and then went inside to purchase cashier checks like checks, as in multiple cashier checks. And then at the Wells Fargo, police say that Akia tells the cashier that she's, like, waiting for a check, or which I don't, I don't really understand what that would have even really meant, why she would have been at the bank waiting for a check, but that's what the investigator said during this, this interview. So the police theory is that she's collecting this money And these checks are for her, you know, deposit for her new home and and for the move with her son's father. But in a different interview, her stepfather completely disputes that information and says that Akia only went to the one bank where she's seen on camera. He says that police have yet to correct this misinformation and that Akia was not seen at multiple locations that day. Now, police also claim that the friend who drove Akia to the bank that day is not a person of interest and has actually been very cooperative and has given them useful information about that day, although they won't say what that information is. And, you know, besides her driving Akia to the bank and then dropping her back off to her apartment, 
there's zero information about that friend or any of the information that they might have given to police. The police do reveal that the last ping on Akia's cell phone was from an area where the bank was located. But if she was dropped off at home, why wouldn't the last ping be closer to her apartment? Now, the lack of transparency from the police just adds to the mystery of Akia's disappearance. And for Akia's family, it adds to the frustration. Like many of these cases, there was no mainstream media attention. Akia's story wasn't shared, and no one outside of Baltimore had really even heard of Akia's story in the months after her disappearance. But Akia's family refused to let her story go. They made their own pleas to the media and reached out to anyone that would be willing to listen. Six months after Akia's disappearance, with no answers and little help, the family of Akia held a vigil outside of her apartment to remember the missing woman and to hopefully encourage anyone in the neighborhood to come forward if they saw or heard anything. But in another strange addition to the story, while cleaning up after the vigil, Akia's family finds her debit card under a bush near her apartment. Now, according to Akia's family, the debit card did not appear like it had been outside for six months. It wasn't weathered and it wasn't worn. It looked like someone had really just placed it there. And so Akia's family says that if the debit card was there when police had first searched six months ago, they would have found it. And the fact that they didn't means someone placed it there after the police searched for it, and they believe that it was recent. Police, of course, like many other things in this case, will only confirm part of this, saying that Akia's debit card was found but would not comment on the condition of the card. A few months after her disappearance, in December 2017, the family was interviewed by True Crime Daily, but still, the national media was not picking up a key story. It's really the first formal interview that I could even really find about her disappearance on the internet. But I also couldn't find a lot of news stories from the early months of Akia's disappearance, which lets me know that there was a lack of attention on this case and it wasn't getting the attention it needed during the critical months after Akia was last seen. In 2019, two years after Akia was last seen, Her stepfather, along with the founders of the Black and Missing Foundation, which, if you don't know, is an incredible organization that is dedicated to helping families of missing Black people, um, helps to bring awareness about their cases and and puts them out in the media and and does really, you know, amazing things. Um, This interview on The View, you know, it helps to bring Akia's story into the spotlight. Because after that interview, more information starts to hit the internet about Akia and her disappearance. But the interview also reveals what many had suspected, and that was that the police were being less than forthcoming with information. And Akia's family said that the level of communication that they were receiving was not where it needed to be. In 2019, Akia's story was also featured on the show Searching For and ID Channels The Missing. But in the episode of Searching For, police revealed that there were dumpsters near the back exit of her apartment. And the dumpsters, police say, are important because they could have used the dumpsters to dispose of Akia's things or possibly hide her body. But for police, it's really just a theory. And They don't reveal whether or not they have any evidence to support that theory. Akia's family, you know, their hope is that with, you know, the new attention on the case and these interviews, you know, that that may encourage someone to come forward with information. 
But unfortunately, no one does. And by this time, the FBI has now joined in on the case and is offering a $25,000 reward for any information. The reward is really a large one, and everyone is hoping that, you know, this large reward will encourage someone to speak up. But still, no one does. You know, there are many questions about Akia's disappearance. So many missing pieces. It's hard to understand why the police, who claim they interviewed over 100 people about this case, have offered such little information to Akia's family. I don't know if the holes in the story are because the police aren't revealing the missing pieces or if it's because there are really just giant holes in the story that don't make sense. I found it strange that, you know, no one spoke to Akia for, you know, three or four days, especially when she had that big event coming up. You know, usually people are calling you, you know, getting last minute details, things like that. You know, and she was also having a high risk pregnancy. So for those close to her to not hear from her for three to four days, just, you know, just really seems odd to me. You know, and I also find it strange that it was never revealed how a kid was supposed to get to her shower that day, seeing that she didn't drive. You know, I assumed that someone was to pick her up for the shower because I doubt at eight months pregnant, she was going to take a bus to her shower. I mean, it was also 2017. So maybe she was planning to call an Uber or a Lyft, but no one in any interviews I saw mentioned that detail. And it just kind of stuck out to me as one of the kind of strange things that happened in those, you know, days in between when she was last seen and when she didn't show up to her shower. But it's also strange about where her belongings No, the police never mention where they think the items could be besides the dumpster theory. It's now been four years since Akia Eggleston was last seen. There have been no recent updates about the case, no new articles, no new true crime shows. Time has continued to move on without Akia and her baby. And although there have been no new interviews or articles, at at least that I could find, regarding this case since about 2019, I know Akia's family is still desperately searching for any answers that can bring them closure. Akia was eight months pregnant when she disappeared, just like Lacey Peterson was when she went missing. But Akia never received nearly the amount of attention Lacey's case did. But her life was just as important. And her unborn son's life was just as important. So, if you live in Baltimore or near the DMV area, please continue to share Akia's story. And if anybody knows anything about her whereabouts, or has any information about what happened. It's been four years. It's time to say something. Akia Eggleston is four foot eight, and at the time of her disappearance, weighed 145 pounds. She's a black female with brown eyes and black hair. The FBI is offering a $25,000 reward for any information that leads to the whereabouts of Akia Eggleston. If you know anything, contact the Baltimore Police Department or the FBI. Thank you for listening to this week's episode. We'll be back next week with a brand new story. Don't forget to leave us a rating on Apple Podcasts. It helps our show grow so we can continue to tell these stories. Like us on Facebook and follow us on Instagram at Black Girl Gone Podcasts.